Good afternoon and welcome to Innovating for Cyber Resilience. To our guests in Ireland, good morning. To our guests in the US, or rather I should say the other way around, good, after, good afternoon in the Irish market, good, after, good morning in the US. And we're delighted to bring you this uh, Innovating for Cyber Resilience event, along with our partners in the US Embassy here in Ireland and to Boston College in the US. We're coming to you uh, from our studio in space on Bride Street, and you're all very welcome uh, here this afternoon to join us for this event. Uh, Dublin BIC, as you know, has a commitment to supporting entrepreneurs to start and scale. And as part of that, we run a number of events, such as funding and scaling our, our quarterly event, but also this event, uh, which is, is a more specialized event focused on cyber security. And we're delighted to be partnering with, with the US Embassy and Boston College to deliver this. We're going to examine cybersecurity uh, today from, from three different aspects, I suppose, to give you a, a full uh, immersive look. We're going to describe the global view, um, and we'll hear from Jeanette, uh, and I'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. And that's kind of a really high level view and uh, on, on what are the global implications of cybersecurity and what's happening in, in that space. And we have a really good panel discussion that we'll introduce as we move through the event. We'll talk about the business of cybersecurity and we've a lovely panel discussion there, understanding the implications and the, the opportunities arising from the business of cybersecurity. And then the human aspect of, of, of cyber and cyber resilience and what does that mean for us as individuals and as humans and, and what does this new brave world that we're living in, what does that mean for us? We have a, an action-packed agenda. We've got you know, some fantastic speakers. We've got some great keynotes. We've got some lovely panel discussions. And we have room for questions, lots of your questions. We'd love you to interact with us. Send us in the questions, and we'll try to get to as many as we possibly can. So that's the purpose for today. You're all very welcome to join us, and I'm delighted that you've carved out 90 minutes of your time to come and spend with us. I'm going to go straight to Robert Mauro from the Boston College. Uh, Bob is the Executive Director of the Irish Institute. He's a founding director of the Global Leadership Institute and uh, has partnered with us here at Dublin BIC on bringing this event to you. So Bob, good morning to you, and uh, I'll hand it over to you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Connor. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I'm dialing in to you today from Boston College in Chestnut Hill. Um, it's wonderful to partner with Dublin uh, Business Innovation Center and the US Embassy Dublin um, on this project, um, Innovating for Cyber Resiliency. And we'll soon turn to our first keynote hearing from uh, Jeanette Manfred in, in, in a moment. But before I do, I wanna take a moment to explain to you why Boston College is involved. Um, for me, Boston College is the best Irish university in the United States. Uh, that's not official BU pol BC policy, excuse me, geez. Um, my wife works over at BU. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a no-no to refer to Boston uh, College as a Boston University, but we are in fact a, a university. We are founded in 1863 uh, by Father uh, John McElroy, a Jesuit from Enniskillen. And he founded the institution to educate Boston's Irish immigrant community. And Boston College has been doing that ever since. If you come to Boston College today and you visit the building uh, in the image behind McGasson Hall, you can go to the Irish room. It's a, it's a, it's a giant room um, that seats you know, 500 people. And on one far end of it is a stained glass of St. Patrick uh, bringing Christianity uh, to Ireland. Uh, and the room itself was donated by the Irish immigrant community uh, to to the university. So there's a deep connection between Boston College and, and Ireland. And that continues today. We have an outstanding Irish studies program with excellence in Irish history and literature. Um, we have an office at St. Stephen's Green. I encourage you to go visit them at 42, 43 St. Stephen's Green at Boston College, Ireland. Uh, there's the work that we do in the Irish Institute and the Global Leadership Institute. There's the work that we do at the Boston College, Ireland Business Council, um, as well as the Kennedy Summer School. We're constantly trying to bring Boston and Ireland closer together. Um, also, I think we should remember that the United States and Ireland have a very special relationship. We saw that just last week um, with St. Patrick's Day. And that started well before the Good Friday Agreement and continued through the Good Friday Agreement and the peace process and continues today to discussions with the executive and Congress on the Brexit uh, challenges. Obviously, the United States was deeply involved in, in the peace process, and that was led by two Massachusetts natives, Ted, Senator Ted Kennedy and Speaker of the House Tip O'Neill. It was Senator Ted Kennedy 
that brought me into the process. Um, and and he, he had an earmark here at Boston College to drive exchange programming with the U.S. Department of State for leaders from Ireland and Northern Ireland to come to, to Boston to study, to work together, to network and exchange. Finally, Boston College is a Jesuit Catholic university. And as such, we seek to address the most challenging and pressing problems that the world faces today. And we hope to intervene in the common good and to, to, to promote the common good. And in fact, digital security is part of that today. We can see that this is important to the transatlantic region. It, it is it's clear the amount of exchange between Europe and the United States um, and, and the United States and Ireland um, and into Europe through Ireland um, is critical to all our, our economic and, and physical security. Uh, tomorrow, President Biden will address the EU Council. Um, but we can also look at the outstanding finance and, and the multinational U.S. institutions that are in finance and tech um, across the island of Ireland uh, as to why there is so much importance. And, and the digital infrastructure is critically important to what we do. Today, we're going to learn a lot about the global view um, and, and the political view and the policy issues surrounding cybersecurity. We'll then talk about the business challenges that, that people face, not only in ensuring a, a resilient cyber and, and a safe digital infrastructure within their institutions, but how to promote organizations to grow and to enhance digital and cybersecurity. And finally, we'll be talking about how we as humans interact with this digital space and what the challenges are of of what happens in the digital space and how we interact as individuals in, in, in the analog space. Um, finally, before I, I turn it over uh, back to Connor, there's a few thank yous I think that um, are appropriate here. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank the US Department of State and the US Embassy in Dublin for funding these programs on an ongoing basis for a number of years. They've been outstanding leaders in promoting leadership exchange between Ireland and, and the United States. Key to that over the years, um, and in this project in particular, have been Chris Vistoski, Angela Geertsen, and, and Mark Bossy, who's no longer at the U.S. Embassy in Dublin. Um, at the U.S. Consulate in Belfast, Peter McKittrick has been steadfast in his support of these kinds of programs. A Dublin Vic has been outstanding working with the crew there, Connor Cromarty, uh, Emma Curran, um, ha have been great supporters. And my own colleagues at Boston College, I'm not an expert in cybersecurity, and I've had to learn from from these people. My uh, my colleague here at the GLI, Mimi Langenderfer, and the director of our cybersecurity program, uh, Kevin Powers, have been outstanding mentors um, in this space. I now turn you back over to Connor. Thank you for joining us today. I do appreciate it, and I hope to hear from you soon. Bob. Uh Bob, thanks so much, uh, and it's great from our side to be partnered with you, uh, to be partnered with the Embassy, uh, and thanks for that overview. We're delighted to be working with you and hope to continue to do so into the future. Um, moving on to our first keynote, um, and the topic we're going to explore is around public cloud technology, and how does that enhance security in uh, uh, cybersecurity in an evolving threat landscape? So for the next few minutes, I'm going to put you in the safe hands of Jeanette Manfra, and Jeanette is the Global Director, Security and Compliance at Google Cloud. Uh, Jeanette, good morning, and I hope you're with us, and I'll hand it over to you and let you kick on. Good morning, everybody. Good morning for anyone who might be on the East Coast. Uh, really pleased to be here. Wish I was here uh, in Ireland in person, but nonetheless, glad to be able to have a chance to talk to you all about um, uh, evolving threat and how public cloud technology can help you on your security journey. Um, as, as was mentioned, my name is Jeanette Manfra. I'm, uh, I'm currently the Global Director for Risk and Compliance at Google Cloud. Um, up until I joined Google about a year ago, I spent uh, about 20 years in the, in the government in various different security roles. I just want to uh, thank quickly the U.S. Embassy in Dublin, Boston College, Dublin BIC for inviting me here today. And I do want to give a special shout out to my friend Chris Pososki for all the partnership, both on this event and our previous partnerships um, when I was in government and, and helping build the U.S.-Irish relationship around cybersecurity. So, um, as I mentioned, I spent about uh, 20 years in the public sector in the United States doing various security roles. My, um, my final role there was as the head of the cybersecurity division in the newly established Cyber and Infrastructure Security Agency. So while I was there, I was responsible for a variety of different things, roughly akin to what the Irish NCSC 
does for, um, for, for Ireland, both in the government and the private sector. So I was responsible for delivering services capabilities to about 100 civilian agencies in the U.S. federal government, as well as our critical infrastructure across the country and our state and local partners. And throughout my time in government, I really spent a great deal of energy, much like many of you probably do in your daily lives, working to keep bad actors out of our systems, or once we inevitably found them inside our systems, trying to quickly kick them out. What I eventually realized was that we were really at a disadvantage. We didn't just have legacy systems that we're dealing with, but we also had a legacy mindset. Our policy capabilities were overly reliant on a perimeter-based approach to defense. In essence, we had built and we're trying to operate these digital fortresses that increasingly were cutting us off from the gains in commercial technology and security. I spent the last few years of my time in government doing my best to modernize this approach to security and supporting the many people who shared this vision, not just within the US government, but actually globally. And most of them, of course, are still there doing this excellent work. This was a key driver for me to actually join Google and, uh, and, and work to improve how agencies and uh, in the private sector can take advantages of what the cloud offers. So as, um, as we'll talk about later in the panel, and as I'm sure many of you know, cybersecurity is not just a, the concern in the domain of the security specialist or the software engineer. It really is everyone's responsibility. So if we take a look at the threat landscape of today, it's really different from the way we looked at it even just a few years ago. In fact, the very nature of the forces at play have shifted. Threats are no longer originating primarily from rogue actors or these nefarious individuals seeking notoriety or a few extra dollars, but they're now encompassing entire organizations like nation states that are really well-funded, very motivated, and really good at what they do. So both private and public sector leaders, we need to figure out ways to bridge this divide between the deep technical details of threats and the practical technical and societal actions, which would make us all less vulnerable to these threats. I'm not going to touch on all of those areas. I'm going to focus specifically on the cloud aspect of it. Um, but uh, there's a rich conversation that uh, we want to continue to have about how we are able to continue to work together to bridge that divide. But what the current landscape definitely shows us is that these existing legacy solutions and our traditional technologies are increasingly vulnerable to security breaches. So what has really become clear to me that if you're serious about security, we have to rethink how we're doing it. And I believe this is how where cloud can actually help. So one of the things that um, I talk with a lot of customers and governments is how the cloud can help organizations actually modernize their security as a part of the digital transformation journey. So for a while, digital transformation, it's almost become this buzzword now that everybody is striving towards, right? It's this very admiral, but often a really elusive goal for many organizations, both in the public and the private sector. It promises higher productivity, lower costs, greater insights that can improve your mission and business outcomes. What's not to love about it, right? But these really bold transformation objectives are often, of course, really complicated to achieve than a leader's originally thought. And what usually ends up happening is these lofty goals are abandoned or reduced in scope. And to be honest, the cause of this is frequently, though not exclusively, security. Security practitioners are often perceived by the business or the larger organization, or sometimes they actually are blockers, not enablers. And typically organizations don't recognize early in the process that a digital transformation or a migration to the cloud also means a requirement for security transformation. And it's not just a requirement, it's actually an opportunity. And not recognizing this early and including security uh, and, and risk and compliance leaders in that conversation actually means a great opportunity loss, not just for the overall cloud journey, but for the security opportunities that could have been um, realized as a part of that. So many organizations, when they are considering the move to the cloud, the often, particularly those that come from a security and risk background, they tend to think of it as something that's creating risk and making them less secure, often because they don't fully understand how the relationship between a cloud provider and a um, in, in the initial organization actually works. And, um, and we've seen this, uh, this perception actually confirmed by independent research, not just our anecdotal and ad hoc conversations with customers. 
But we also believe, and this has been confirmed, that moving to the cloud can help organizations improve their security and risk posture. And we know this because we've seen it happen in our own organization and we've seen it happen with many customers. Especially these days, where you have employees and users on the move, organizations, everybody's got this influx of remote devices and inputs to secure. You've got data moving to the cloud from on-prem environments. You often have hybrid environments. So you have this incredibly complex um, set of uh, security objectives that you're trying to achieve. So even back in the day, protecting users, data, applications, while all while staying compliant with uh, regulations can be challenging as in the last year, that's made it even more so. And uh, we want to ensure that the protection and compliance that you need happens as you move to the cloud. So going back to that notion of a digital fortress and that um, building these walls around and those moats and also in you know, your archers, everything that over the years we've been taught to believe is the right thing to do and to have that trusted interior, we need to break down that notion that that is actually going to help you be more secure and that it actually helps you be more productive. And I really do believe that dream of lowering costs, improving your productivity and improving security is actually possible. And we know because we've done it internal to Google. So practically, um, I think that there are, um, my advice at least, there's six basic tenets that based off of Google's experience, my own experience, those of a lot of different um, partners and, and customers that we've talked to, there's six tenets that I would encourage you to think about and to follow as a security leader or as a business leader in general. First, we talked about a lot about risk and the notion that many organizations um, perceive a great amount of risk when they move to the cloud, but they don't exactly know how to quantify that risk. And so they tend to take that legacy way of, um, of capturing that risk and just trying to sort of shove it, shove it into a modern environment. So I would say it's really important first in everything that you do to take a risk informed, not a risk avoidance approach. As we all know, there's no such thing as absolute security in any situation. And the same is definitely true in cloud. We're not promising that all of your risk is going to, weigh, or going to go away, but your risk posture will be different. And you need to understand what it is. There are tremendous benefits that you will gain, but the way that it works, the way that you think about risk has to change. Some of your current risks are going to be completely transferred over. The cloud provider will provide you that trusted infrastructure. You won't be paying for those data centers and having all of that time spent and that operational and, and cost overhead. And, um, and so you will be able to um, change how you think about risk, but there will become new responsibilities that you will need to take on as an organization. So you need to understand that upfront. And, and all throughout your process is questioning, what is my risk posture? What are my goals? Remove the technology from it, but what are my goals for the organization? What is the risk posture for my organization? What are the security outcomes I need in order to enable that business? And then make sure that you're having and, and you're flexible enough to understand how that risk posture is going to change with the adoption of such a game-changing set of technologies such as cloud. So don't seek to avoid the risks but understand them and understand how you um, modernize your organization and your operational practices as a part of that. So I wanted to take a little bit of time to dive into the second area, which is often referred to as zero trust. Um, because this um, can cause a, a fair amount of confusion. Um, I know I was confused when I was still learning about it. Um, and, and there's a lot of different sort of technologies and everything associated with it. But zero trust is very important for your modernizing uh, security. So um, the this phrase zero trust, and there's also a few other phrases kind of associated with it. I, the one thing I want you to take away is that zero trust is a philosophy. It is not a technology. It is not something that you can just sort of buy off the shelf and say, I am now zero trust. Zero trust is a different way of doing security for your organization. And it's based off of one fundamental, I believe a very profound security insight, but it's also very basic, sometimes so basic that people forget what it, what it is. And that is that the location of your network offers you no security value. And, and Google recognized this 
um, a little over 10 years ago that the, the, the need to make sure that we were able to have a global workforce that could access multiple sensitive applications to be able to do so from untrusted networks, combined with the security insight that the way the threat landscape had been evolving meant that our traditional model of having these layers of um, you know, trusted networks and, on, on the inside and then increasing layers of defense, it didn't make sense. It didn't make sense for the business and it didn't make sense from a security perspective. So even the very name of the, our solution, which we developed over time, Beyond Corp, was born from that insight. We needed to actually operate securely beyond the corporate network. And um, in zero trust and cloud go very well together. Um, they are not they are not the same thing, but it's very important to to think about how you can apply the lessons learned from zero trust um, when you're thinking about modernizing your approach to security. And again, cloud can enable that, but there is a, a lot um, that goes into that. The most important thing about thinking of um, when you're when you're talking about zero trust, and my best advice for security leaders is don't say I'm going to do zero trust or I'm committed to zero trust. Those are really important things, but to what end? Why are you doing zero trust? And and to come up with a very simple, compelling goal for Google, it was to have every Google employee able to work anywhere without the use of a VPN, and that was a, the, the goal of the organization. That was the um, executive sponsorship behind it. And that very simple goal spawned a series of disruptive innovations when we had no other viable alternative to be able to achieve that goal. So I can tell you as an employee, having spent a long time navigating VPNs and all the sort of associated barriers that we would put up to make sure that we kept those most sensitive um, applications uh, as, as trusted as possible, it is really awesome living in a world where you can have not only um, a higher level of productivity from anywhere, but you can have that higher level of security. So now the rest of the world is facing a lot of these challenges as well. The last year has just fundamentally operated how businesses and governments operate probably forever. We now have a likely permanently distributed extended workforce, which needs to remain as productive in remote locations as they do in the office, and which is leading to widespread dissolution of the corporate network perimeter or a tremendous amount of investment in all of these perimeter controls that are making it more difficult for you to be productive and increasing your security overhead. Then you combine that with just this continued ongoing damage created by malicious software that are inserted into corporate networks that disrupt critical business functions. And then you've got the continued abuse of trusted account in these digital trust relationships that we historically have depended upon. So I believe this really causes for a fundamental rethink of how you're approaching security in your organizations. And the zero trust philosophy really offers you a, a proven approach and architectures and best practices to do that. But again, remember, it's not a technology. It is a way of doing business and it is a long-term shift in the way of doing business. It's not something you can do right away. So you have to think about that as a security leader and as a business leader. Very important to do, fundamental to see your success, but will require a long-term commitment into, um, into modernizing this approach. So, um, the, uh, the rest of the tenets I uh, want you to, to think about are um, uh, next is around automation and data. We, um, there's a, a lot of organizations really spend a fair amount of time doing things manually. When you move to the cloud, when you um, have the zero trust um, approach, when you incorporate all of these, all of these amazing security technologies that the market is providing, you cannot continue to rely on that manual approach. You can be more secure and more effective with your data and intelligence. So spend some time thinking about how, um, what those, what those data elements are that you need going back to your risk posture as you understand it. What data do you need to inform you as to whether your risk posture is changing? How can you harvest that data for useful intelligence? And importantly, to the, to the next piece of advice that I want to give you, the fifth tenet, is thinking about your workforce. You will need to reskill and rethink how your organization works. They will become less about manual operators of um, harvesting data and responding to um, all sorts of different incidents. They will have to become data analysts, data scientists um, in, in thinking differently about how they operate. So make sure that when you commit to that cloud journey that you're thinking about your organization and the change that we have to go through. And, and please think about especially how your employees are going to come along with you on that journey. 
And less, and probably most importantly, at least from my perspective, you need to have a strong partnership with your cloud provider. You have to have a shared understanding of risk and security objectives. The overall security, people talk a lot when they talk about cloud, the shared responsibility model, it is, we, we really think it's actually more about shared fate. We are in this together with our customers. We are providing um, a level of risk management that is no longer the responsibility of our customer and our customers have um, responsibilities that they have to provide. So make sure that you and your cloud provider have that shared understanding. And in the case where it's the security and um, risk management is the responsibility of the cloud provider, make sure you understand and have a shared understanding of how you as a customer are gonna conduct oversight of that. It should be very open, transparent, and continuous dialogue between you and um, and your cloud provider. So those are my those are my um, basic uh, advice. I wanted to spend uh, just a couple of minutes talking about something that's very important to our European customers, and that's uh, open strategic autonomy, or what some might refer to as digital sovereignty, which is of course on top of everyone's agenda. The term might be relatively recent, but the concept is not new. Europe wants to think strategically about its approach to information technology, and we definitely support that. Customers and policymakers have placed an even greater emphasis on working with cloud service providers to protect our customers' most sensitive information. Based on our conversations with uh, our customers and policymakers, this focus is driven by concerns about government access to sensitive European public and private sector data and concerns about European customers' reliance on global cloud service providers to support these critical services and workloads. For Google Cloud, the approach to digital autonomy has been an evolution. In 2019, we made a commitment to our European customers to continue to expand our data security and privacy capabilities. This reflects our core belief that customers should have the strongest levels of control over data stored in the cloud in addition to the highest levels of security. So in terms of our technology approach, we can provide our customers with a whole suite of technical uh, advances that can achieve those various strategic autonomy and sovereignty requirements. But overall, we want to encourage you to have that relationship with the cloud provider that I discussed to make sure we have um, meaningful mitigations to challenges such as vendor lock-in, single point of failure, all while getting to that core shared goal of resilience and open strategic autonomy of cloud services. So we covered a lot today. I encourage you to continue this conversation, understand the um, how the marketplace um, and the internet overall is evolving, partner closely with your cloud provider if you've chosen to go on that journey and really look forward to working with each of you and answering your questions. Thank you. Hey, Jeanette, thank you so much. Uh, and thanks for, for joining us this morning. Great overview. Uh, I love the, the piece about it's not a technology, it's a way of, of doing business. Um, and I'm certainly looking forward to exploring that in the panel discussion, along with the end of the digital fortress. And I think that's kind of some interesting pit, bits to pick up there. So stay with me, Jeanette, and we'll go to the panel. Uh, and I'll ask um, Heli Tirmaklar, who's going to join us as well. She's the ambassador at large for cybersecurity at the Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And we're going to ask Katrina Heinel to moderate this panel for us. And Katrina is executive director at the Azure Forum for Contemporary Security Strategy and an adjunct research fellow at the University College Dublin. So Katrina, good afternoon to you and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much. I hope you can hear me. Um, please shout if you can't. I, I'm conscious of the of the connection. Um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, it's wonderful to to be moderating this session today. Um, I see familiar faces um, on our panel. Um, and um, I would also like to thank the US Embassy, Dublin BIC and Boston College um, for organizing this um, for all of us. In our session today, the particular focus um, that we have is to delve a little bit more deeply on the global public-private sector cooperation um, question. Jeanette has, has, has already alluded to some of the EU issues with respect to digital sovereignty and strategic autonomy. So again, we might get into that more deeply as the conversation goes on. But um, it's safe to say we have two of the best placed experts um, to speak to these questions today. Jeanette, um, can speak to the specific focus of the panel with her high level experience um, as Assistant Secretary uh, for Cybersecurity at DHS previously, but also now working in a global tech firm like, like Google. 
And then uh, we have Heli Termaklar, who is the Estonian ambassador for cyber diplomacy. And Heli is without doubt one of the most expert cyber diplomats um, in Europe, if not globally, given her experience at national level in, national level in Estonia but also with the European External Action Service. So Heli, I hope you don't mind me saying that you are um, you are in the Premier League when it comes to, to cyber diplomacy. And it's lovely to see you again today. So to begin, um, um, Jeanette, um, uh, we spoke um, very briefly about the, the kind of the direction we wanted to go on the panel. Um, and firstly, I think it would be, it would be good to hear from you um, about how businesses and governments can work together a bit more closely and effectively when it comes to cybersecurity questions like incident response um, or um, cyber pre preparedness. Um, in particular, if you have examples um, of national good practices, um, I know you're based in, in the United States, but there might be other national good practices that you feel we can draw upon. I think that would also be good to hear. So thank you, Jeanette, I'll pass the floor to you. Great. Um, absolutely. I th the U.S. definitely doesn't have a monopoly on best practices for public-private partnership. And in, in fact, um, when I was in the government, spent a lot of time learning from other governments and how they were approaching. So I think, you know, the, the U.S. has been working on this public-private partnership model for cybersecurity for going on 20 years now, um, if my math is right. And um, we've, we've learned a lot over the process. The importance of having open multi-stakeholder uh, dialogues, ensuring that um, all voices are represented in, you know, if you're looking at that kind of the broader ecosystem of the internet, um, who, where are those voices? If we want to continue to maintain the, the, the global open internet that we've all tremendously benefited from, the, the need to have those transparent, open conversations with multiple stakeholders, very important. And I think Europe has done um, an especially good job, both in, as the union, but also individual countries. I, um, and I will not steal anything from our Estonian ambassador because I think Estonia is just really such a, a model in, in how to do this leading across Europe, but also within Estonia. So um, I will let the ambassador speak to, to the specifics there. Um, I would also say there's very interesting examples in um, in Asia in looking at you know Japan and South Korea and and the work that they're doing to define critical infrastructure in the Middle East and Israel and um, everybody has um, different you know as a as a country slightly different approaches we all have the same overall goal objectives um, you know generally those you know those countries that are seeking to maintain that that open interoperable internet um, but individually. I think my experience is what works best is, um, in addition to these multi-stakeholder dialogues, is having clear um, goals that you are trying to achieve. Oftentimes people lump all um, public-private partnerships for cybersecurity is one kind of grand thing. And the most important thing I think I learned is there are um, certain things uh, sort of subordinate to that, right, that we want to achieve, whether that's um, a better, more scalable incident response to be able to respond to, you know, heaven forbid, a very large um, disaster for a country. That is one set of conversations that requires specific organizations, and we want to have specific outcomes. There's another set of conversations when you talk about um, increasing uh, better global norms for um, for cyber behavior um, by governments. That is obviously another conversation with um, a, a different set of organizations that, that continues to be had. So really defining what you want out of your public-private partnership is, is important and, um, and, and being clear, and all parties are clear, whether I'm on the government side or whether I'm on the private sector side of of, um, what the outcomes you're seeking to achieve. It's also important to recognize the marketplace and how the marketplace is evolving and um, in making sure that government is um, clear about both the economic and the security goals that they're trying to achieve and, um, and, and how to um, achieve both of those and um, recognizing that sometimes, frankly, they're intention. 
So um, they, I will say the last piece is um, important, I think, um, is relying on as much as possible global international standards. And, um, and, and if they don't exist, um, working to develop those and in really having, if we continue to maintain that goal of having that global open internet, then we want to ensure that we have things like open source, that is you know, robust, vibrant open source uh, ecosystem, international standards, things that can be applied as much as possible globally where it makes sense. I'll pause there back to you, Katrina. Great, thank you very much, Jeanette. Um, I think two key messages um, I'm hearing here, um, you know, thinking beyond the US and EU in terms of some of the good practices we're seeing in other in other regions like Asia when it comes to Japan and, and um, South Korea and their work on defining critical infrastructure. Um, but also, um, and, and Heli might come to this, but, but how to strengthen multi-stakeholder dialogues um, by having clear goals and defining the outcomes, the optimal outcomes that we are seeking. Um, so with that, Heli, um, I think with your experience at the national, regional um, and also UN level, um, from a government perspective, are there effective ways in your mind that we can work to increase um, this type of cooperation uh, globally? Thank you, Heli. Uh, thank you, Katrona. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, uh, always very glad to speak at the Irish event. I think it's already the second uh, of, of this series when I'm speaking. And uh, as a small country in Europe, uh, uh, similar to Ireland, uh, uh, Estonia actually has uh, uh, built um, its own national public-private partnership on cybersecurity already uh, more than 10 years ago. Um, the major elements for our public-private partnership include uh, very um, clear objectives, as uh, our uh, uh, previous speaker was telling them, the objectives and goals are important in public-private partnership. And I absolutely subscribe to this uh, notion, because uh, when um, Estonia started to develop its national cyber strategy in 2007, after the serious uh, test we had uh, towards our digital society here in 2007, um, uh, we uh, actually uh, set the very clear goals with the first national cyber strategy, which was the first uh, full of government cyber strategy in the world at that time. And, uh, and this strategy uh, has been the model for our national uh, cyber resilience systems ever since. And of course, now we have like the fourth iteration of the strategy already happening. But it's the same logic that applies. So, uh, secondly, we also set a very clear governance structure uh, already in, uh, very early. How the um, uh, different players uh, and different stakeholders uh, uh, are functioning in this uh, broader framework. And, uh, uh, and this governance structure uh, is not just a formal governance structure. There is also the element of informal uh, cooperation and informal uh, information exchange there. But there is also the element of formality that all has helped to put um, uh, national resources into the um, cyber project. And, uh, and of course, uh, very important, there is also a very important element of coordination between different uh, stakeholders. And uh, this uh, coordination uh, requires also the um, uh, clear set of um, um, functions and division of labor between the national players. So, and in Estonian case, we set up the National Cyber Agency that is uh, also in charge of the e-governance. So Estonia is a small country, we do not have uh, thousands of agencies with uh, overlapping tasks. So we are trying to make sure that uh, rather we uh, coordinate between different agencies and uh, and make sure that um, uh, both uh, the public sector and the private sector would uh, talk to each other. And I think our resilience system actually has worked quite well because uh, I don't know whether we can uh, see this as a metrics, but um, when NotPetya was ramaging through Europe and, and uh, global networks, then Estonia was virtually untouched by those ransomware attacks in 2017. Uh, also because of the very good information sharing and early warning system we have here and, uh, and the close public-private partnership between the different, um, different parts of our system. So uh, I think uh, this kind of uh, 
public-private partnership always should start at national level. And, um, and when we are taking this to the global level, then uh, we also have to specify what we talk about exactly. I think uh, when I was in the EU, we had many conversations with global companies about the public-private partnership. And I think it was actually somebody from Microsoft who said, well, great that you governments are talking about the public-private partnership, but what exactly do you want from us? And what exactly do you mean we should do and when we should show up and do something? So I think this was uh, uh, one of the um, re requests from the private sector side um, to specify a bit uh, what exactly could be done. And, um, and I think the Paris call uh, was one of those um, uh, good initiatives, uh, which was uh, launched a few years ago by by the French government and a couple of companies that um, uh, would be um, a, a, a good example of public-private partnership and how this um, could be taken forward. And uh, of course, uh, I all also have been very closely involved in the recent United Nations processes in Open Ended Working Group and GGE where we are um, stressing the important role of the private sector in those reports and recommendations written purely by governments in, under the first committee of the, of the United Nations. So therefore, um, I think um, whenever we are looking at the global uh, ecosystem of cybersecurity and, uh, and uh, when, when we are talking about resilience, then certainly the involvement of all stakeholders is, uh, is uh, always mentioned. But I think there, I, if I may to uh, also uh, maybe add something to this debate, there is a field where um, uh, more of this type of public-private partnership might be necessary. And this is achieving the sustainable development goals. So um, we already have a uh, private sector quite involved in uh, setting up the digital ecosystem in the developing nations, but but uh, I think it's also important that the private sector involvement will be there to set up the um, cyber resilience uh, uh, in, in the developing countries and, uh, and be part of this effort. So I think that's uh, one of those um, areas where we could see some future activities um, happen. I stop here. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heli. Um, again, key messages um, emphasising this need for clear goals, um, including a national strategy when it comes to um, public-private partnerships, um, but also starting at the national level and building out then to the global level. Um, in some respects, you, you took the, the thunder out of my next question. I was going to ask you about the Paris call in particular, um, as well as the, the work, the efforts with the UN Open-Ended Working Group to involve non-governmental stakeholders. Um, so uh, with that, I think what I might do is ask Jeanette for her perspective on some specific um, initiatives that you, you are privy to, Jeanette, at global level that you think are worth uh, delving more deeply into. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, we really covered um, many of them and um, the additional ones that I might call out would be the work in the ISO standards where you have public and private sector coming together to um, to lay out global standards, very important initiatives, very important for governments to maintain involvement in those bodies. Um, they can really set the future for, um, for what organizations in the private sector will be doing. Um, and I would also, I think I'd just like to end on um, Ireland more specifically. I had, when I was in the government, um, I had the opportunity to visit um, with our Irish partners a couple of times and um, wonderful hosts as always, but I uh, was able to learn a great deal about um, the, uh, the, the Irish National Cybersecurity Authority and was able to participate in a lot of the dialogues that they were having with um, uh, Irish uh, critical infrastructure. And I thought that their approach approach was, um, it, it really meant all the things you sort of talked about, is um, you know, understanding 
um, what Ireland needed to, to do to, of course, achieve, um, you know, broader global regulatory outcomes, um, applying that to the Irish context and, and having an open dialogue with, um, with the Irish private sector, um, primarily those responsible in the, in those traditional critical infrastructure sectors. So I really applaud Ireland for the work that they're doing. And um, in, in the work that they're doing to advance academic research in um, partnership with academic institutions, both in Ireland and globally, um, and their sort of strong uh, voice and, and perspective on, on data protection, both within Europe and, uh, and locally and, and globally. So I'd like to just sort of end as a, with a shout out to the, the men and women that are working in the, uh, the Irish National Cybersecurity Center. Thank you, Jeanette. Um, I, I can't speak for them, but I, I would guess that like, like all of us, we would have preferred to meet in person and uh, continue the conversations you had when you were last here. Um, I think, Heli, uh, on that, I know while you're based in Estonia, but I wonder whether there are any um, lessons that you think uh, could apply to the Irish context or, or other smaller states, um, uh, if you don't want to speak to the specific Irish context, but um, it would be good to hear your thoughts on that as well. I think uh, the, um, uh, there are different models actually in Europe you can observe on the, on the cybersecurity public-private partnership and uh, um, it might be related to the size of the state but um, uh, actually it might be also related to a uh, historical institutional organizational history of a country well uh, because uh, uh, we we usually uh, uh, I think we, we can categorize several models in, in Europe. Uh, one model is the um, a small country model which is based on uh, close relations between the stakeholders and the trust-based uh, close-knit type of cyber community which, um, that actually is located mostly on the civilian side of the government like Estonian model. So our um, national cyber agency is um, situated um, with the um, information system agency, which is purely civilian. Uh, it cooperates, of course, with all other agencies and so on, but it is still under the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Communications. Um, the same type of model we can see in Finland and in some other parts um, of Northern Europe where uh, the um, competence and expertise has been uh, collecting under certain agency on the civilian side and grown there. So uh, the uh, benefits of uh, building this under the civilian side um, is maybe the easier outreach to the private sector that finds it more easy to talk to the civ other civilians, uh, not maybe so easily with other militaries or mili intelligence officials. So. So the trust is uh, maybe easier to build uh, when there are cyber agencies under the civilian side. But it doesn't mean that it has to be like this. It's just one of the models that we see in Europe. Then, uh, then we see also the, um, a different model, which is a bit more, um, uh, shall, I, shall I say, maybe top down, uh, where uh, there is a stronger regulation, usually part of the country's institutional and organizational history. And... Um, and, the, uh, and also this kind of regulation holds together the larger system uh, and the cyber security is built on a more sectoral model and the sectoral search and, uh, and the sectoral search then reporting to the central search. So I think we can see this kind of model in France uh, where um, there is one uh, national uh, uh, center, but it's also uh, strong sectors, uh, industrial uh, sectors that are actually part of, of the cyber effort there. And, um, and then we have the um, uh, defense intelligence model as well in Europe, uh, where uh, this, the cyber expertise is mostly under uh, some defense or intelligence structure, and it is laid uh, there, and the national effort is laid from there. Um, when the European Union has issued its NIS directive and we had those NIS coordination groups in Brussels, then we saw very different people coming from capitals there because the NIS directive um, asked to determine the competent cyber authority from each country. 
And this uh, competent cyber authority would be under very different parts of the governmental um, authorities. So, uh, and in, in, in many of, uh, especially maybe um, Eastern European countries or Southern Eastern European countries, the, um, the defense-led model is, uh, is also there. And um, I think uh, this is just how, how the country has decided to set up its model. So it doesn't mean that it's uh, uh, somehow more preferential or, or than the others. Uh, if it works for this country, it is good. So, and I think um, uh, every every country has to decide what model works for them, uh, and set its cyber model to already existing uh, structures that actually are um, functional. But I think there are some characteristics uh, what uh, one has to keep in mind when building a cyber um, agency or cyber system. First, this um, national agency or, or authority needs to have a um, uh, a good standing amongst other national authorities. If it doesn't have a good standing, if it's not having enough authority, then it has to be elevated to a certain level of, of authority. We actually did it in Estonia. The, um, the information system agency here was first initially um, at the uh, different status than now, and we elevated its status in terms of national legal system. Well, you know, continental Europe is very legalistic, so I'm not going into the laws, but it, it, everything needs to have a law here. And um, and once uh, this new law was passed, then this uh, agency had enough authority to act open uh, and, and also have monitoring and overseeing function, and, and this helped. Uh, secondly, this uh, cyber agency needs to be somehow um, also uh, politically steered uh, in a way that... Um, it can easily adapt to, uh, towards the new situation and also uh, can have resources available uh, if necessary quite quickly. Uh, so it helps that it is um, uh, somehow under the direct uh, steering of a minister, uh, which would be our case, uh, uh, or, or a high level of uh, uh, senior leadership. Uh, and uh, what we did in Estonia was also that uh, the governance was set in a way that there is a natural element of cooperation and coordination already part of the governance system. So we have a National Cybersecurity Council, which is led by quite high level. So in order, again, to have this kind of political steering function and, and allow the resources to uh, be allocated quickly if necessary. Because uh, I think uh, in our case that would be the permanent secretary level, which is uh, chairman of the of the National Cybersecurity Council, which is the highest body of uh, decision making. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Heli. Thank you, Jeanette. And thank you, Katrina, for moderating. Before I leave you go, uh, a fascinating discussion. And Jeanette, if I may come to you with one question. We've spent some time talking about the threat landscape um, and I love that digital fortress and I'm, surprised, I'm just sorry we haven't got time to get more into that. But if I could ask you, in your view, when you consider the threats that, that we've been discussing, what do you think is the most important technological innovation that you see coming down that will help us address those threats? I don't think that there is one technological innovation. I think um, between uh, migrating um, to the to the cloud um, where it makes sense for you and adopting that zero trust philosophy are those two components will go a long way to modernizing your security and being able to better defend yourself. Uh, unfortunately, I, I really don't think there is just one technology that is going to be able to cut you uh, cut across. There's a lot of supporting technologies, but you have to be able to use them in the right way. It's not just the technology. It's not just one thing that fits. It's one size. It's it's a holistic approach that we're taking, and and the discussion around you know government, business, the technology, bringing all of those pieces together. Fantastic. Absolutely. Katrina, uh, Jeanette and Heli, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the conversation. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And once again, thank you and hope you enjoy the rest of the session. So uh, moving on then, uh, the, the second part we're going to talk about is the business of cybersecurity and what impacts does it have on, on business? Um, and to do that, I'm joined by Paul C. Dwyer, who's the CEO of Cyber Risk International. Uh, Paul, good afternoon. I'm also joined on the panel, or Paul is joined on the panel by Diane Reynolds, who's a partner at McElroy, Deutsch, Mulvaney and Carpenter, LLP in the US. 
Rob Leslie, who's the founder and CEO of Sadishi, and Jackie Fox, who's managing director of Accenture Security in Ireland. So, Paul, good afternoon. Uh, I appreciate your time and joining us, and I'll hand it over to you, and let's discuss the business of cybersecurity. Good afternoon, Connor, and good afternoon, everybody. And may I say, Connor, you're doing a fantastic job. This is really a, a top quality event. I'm really enjoying listening in to all the speakers. It's been fantastic so far, and I'm looking forward to moderating this session. So um, an extended thank you to um, Dublin BIC, Boston College, and of course, the United States Embassy. So if I start off and just kick straight in, um, and maybe I'll start off with Jackie, if that's okay. Um, and Jackie, let's talk a little bit about um, the challenges businesses have in relation to making sure they have the appropriate cyber strategy in place. Because we've heard already about so many different things that can be done, so many different pieces of technology. And we're, we exist in challenging times when uh, people are trying to do digital transformation. They're trying to uh, do the most with the resources they have, uh, people and financial. Um, what's, what's your key advice in relation to how to make sure you have the appropriate cyber strategy for your business strategy? I think it's really important that you have both the business and your cybersecurity and your technology professionals all speaking together. Uh, you can't have it, this operating in a silo. It's very much, you know, uh, the voice of all. Um, and uh, being able to speak a common language between uh, both groups, the business and the technologists in there uh, to identify, like, what are the key assets? And your key assets aren't IT systems. They're more processes that you're running that keep your business alive um, and you know what what is it that we would really miss if it, if it wasn't working in the morning uh, what would be really valuable if somebody else got got hold of it so I think it's identifying the key risks and threats to your business and then putting appropriate controls in place uh, to deal with that be it process be it technology be it kind of putting people into <coughs> into roles to think about Thanks, Jackie. And if I can just add a follow on there. So we're obviously in in these unique times when things are changing quite um, quickly for a lot of organizations. They have to adapt with their technology and so on. Um, could you elaborate maybe on how they can best do that in the times of the challenges we have working from home remotely, um, the extended threat landscape, different in inherent cyber risk, and maybe, you know, different milestones and working you know, under fire, so to speak, and 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 trying to do that. What what are your um your sort of key pieces of advice on on how they can understand if they're doing it properly? Um, well, I think you know a lot of businesses faced a huge challenge recently. You know, having to go into the working from home environment and it brought a whole load of new threats in there. Whether it's people not working around other people, whether it's that they were uh, rushing and putting new technologies in place, and it was really important that people had a look back there. But, you know, put that to one side and just say that regardless of, of what happened there, um, a lot of businesses are going through some kind of digital transformation speed at the moment. And it's really important that they're putting that security lens early in the project and not just kind of going and testing things at the end and saying, you know, let's do a penetration test last day and see whether or not it's working and then go, oops, sorry, there's a fundamental design problem we had in here that we should have looked at in the beginning. So, so I think it's making sure that... Um, as businesses either move to the cloud or transform in any way digitally or put in, you know, kind of new technologies that they are actually doing uh, doing and thinking about security from the very beginning and shifting left in that cycle um, to make sure that they're doing it safely. It, it's definitely um, less expensive for an organization to design things and architect things right and engineer things right in the first place, rather than having to follow up and put sticking plasters on everything afterwards. Um, and and you know, it's it's a difficult decision for, for businesses because security cost is often thought of as being an overhead um, as opposed to an investment or, you know, looking at it as part of their innovation. Um, and I, I think people need to change their mindset a little bit on that, because if you rush to market with something and it's not secure, uh, you can be guaranteed that uh, it, it'll either fall down at some stage or somebody will, will break into it easily if it's easy to get into and it won't look good for you um, in, in the long term. 
Fantastic. Great advice there, Jackie. And uh, Diane, if I can turn to you, and it's very nice to, to virtually meet you. I know we haven't spoken before, but if I could talk to you about, you know, arguably um, the NIST cybersecurity framework is one of the greatest cyber gifts that the United States has shared with the world. Um, can we talk a little bit about frameworks, risk management, the legal side, and, and your advice on how people can make sure that they're operating legally in relation to the cybersecurity controls they have from a global perspective? It's a triumvirate of business, tech, and legal. And um, our experience has been that it, it is crucial to have this interdisciplinary activity. And we work with a team. So we have tech guys that work with us on a global basis. And um, uh, the, NIST, the NIST framework provides a great, uh, you know, uh, sort of skeleton for which to, um, to operate off of. But it, it, it comes, you know, time and time again back to human error. So if you, you know, if you have this great technology, you still have to have the policies and procedures. You still have to have the training, and you still have to have repetitive and repeated repetitive, um, you know, um, training because otherwise, I mean, it's human error that that is the biggest cause of the of the, of the issue. Absolutely, you know, starts and ends with, with the uh, with the human. I mean, in, in relation to just maybe a little follow on on that. I mean, one of the the most complex quagmires, I suppose, that we, we deal with in, in the cyber landscape is the whole legal aspect of it. Is the, the regulations and so on, and how different they are around the world. Um, could could you share some of your thoughts in relation to um, the the challenges and the approaches people can take, for example, um, for maybe a transatlantic cybersecurity approach for businesses that are operating in North America and Europe uh, um, and how to, to balance those different views of privacy, those different views in relation to regulations and so on. Well, yeah, yeah, I'm based in New York and I, I think the view, the view on the coasts is, and so then that I, I think, you know, pretty much um is a is a good is a good view i mean most of of our clients are in fact uh, following gdpr because it is um it is probably going to be the wave of the future i mean you know um if, if you look at you know gdpr put a a, a data breach uh, you know sort of reporting mechanism in, in into their rules and the u.s while we had you know data breach procedures, we really didn't have a proactive stance. And now you can see, I mean, literally, probably every week to, I don't know, 17, 18 days on average, one of the states is proposing legislation to do, to have some sort of a proactive um, safe harbor sort of a, a process in place. So I think that they're moving together, but I think in general, it's going to move more and more towards the, the GDPR template. So that's what all of our clients are in fact aspiring to and looking to comply to. The U.S. is still a checkerboard. We just don't have, um, or at least the thinking now is that there is not enough um, cohesion to be able to pass a federal uh, statute but the states are taking active roles in being more proactive. So it's not just about, you know, once, once it happens, here's what you do. It's more about preventing that from happening. So. Fantastic. It's really interesting that, you know, uh, that the GDPR has been seen as a sort of taken from a global approach. And what we're seeing that ourselves uh, around the world. And, and, and it's a great uh, accolade to the work that was put into um, GDPR. Um, Rob, if I can chat to you a little bit about technology itself. I mean, in, in the again, alluding to the times we're in um, and the elephant in the room being COVID and so on and people working from home. Um, could you talk to me a little bit about the, the importance of digital identities? Well, I think what COVID has, has done has placed a major transformation uh, effort um, on businesses generally um, and turned what used to be face-to-face -face, uh, relationships into purely digital ones. Um, and now we're you know, faced with the challenges of how do you onboard a customer uh, who you may never have met? Um, how do you prove that they really are who they say they are? Um, and this touches, you know, so many areas, um, you know, the, the legal issues around um, 
how you capture that information and how you process it, where you send it. Um, you know, if you're a US company with your, your assets in the cloud in the United States, for example, and you're onboarding European uh, citizens, is that information processed in Europe or does it get sent to America? These are, you know, legal issues that, that you're going to have to deal with. I mean, if I talk about what we do and some of the challenges that we experience on a, on a daily basis, um, you know, we're a small SME based in Ireland. We have a cloud first posture simply because we don't have the resources uh, internally to be able to take anything other than, than a cloud um, position. We rely on Amazon and Microsoft um, others uh, to do all the sort of technical heavy lifting that we just don't have the internal capability to do. And, you know, when Jeanette was speaking in the last panel, um, you know, she said it's cloud plus a whole variety of different supporting technologies that I think, you know, we're going to see over the next period of time in order to help organizations um, enhance their security postures. And I think that's exactly right. Um, you know, it's security with privacy, with, um, you know, the, the ability to identify reliably who, who people and who companies are in order to protect yourself um, from fraud, from criminality of, of, of any kind, whether that is, uh, you know, somebody trying to steal your money or, or your inter intellectual uh, property in some way. Um, all of it is going to come through a, a digital channel, I think. And um, knowing who all the actors are in your ecosystem, in your ecosystem are, is going to be critically important. Internal actors as well as external actors. Um, you know, and, and I think, um, you know, Jackie probably comes across this fairly regularly that the greatest risks to an organization sometimes appear within the organization. Um, rather than externally. So um, knowing who everybody is is critically important, I think. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes a, a, a lot of sense. And if, if I refer back to you, Jackie, on that point, um, you, you talked about people knowing their businesses and the assets that they're trying to protect and, and, and the business goals they're trying to achieve and so on. Um, do you find that organizations understand their own business value chain? Do they understand um, their supply chain? Do they actually understand what, what are the key components? Do they confuse cyber resilience with business continuity and disaster recovery or what, what what's your feel for when you're dealing with with organizations um uh, from and and that take from the leadership level do they actually understand what cyber resilience is um some organizations do um i think um sadly there's nothing like a good breach to make to focus the mind on on you know what is <laughs> you the said it <laughs> and business resilience the uh, um and, and i think that you know, a lot of organizations know they have to put um, uh, kind of business continuity in place and they will do reviews and they will think about how they're going to address that. But when it comes down to it, uh, when their plans get tested for real for the first time, there are always going to be learnings that, that people have to filter in there. Um, and, you know, like at the moment, there's so much going on kind of in the supply chain at the moment, like with, with solar winds, uh, with the Microsoft Exchange kind of uh, issue that we've had kind of going around at the moment. You know, a lot of people are looking at, well, actually, we, we sort of have to presume that we're breached, we're compromised, that our supply chain is probably breached and compromised. Um, and, you know, you don't see anybody throwing stones at the organisation's who've had these issues recently, whether it's a zero day or whether they had actually been infiltrated because everybody is thinking, well, that, you know, who, who's going to be next? Like, you know, this just has to be a, a presumption and it ties back in with, with what Jeanette was saying about having that zero trust mentality, you know, that it's no longer good enough to have a perimeter around your network and saying we will put up the walls and defend in that way. Uh, we now have to take a view that, that the threat is inside and that we are, uh, you know, continually monitoring and watching for what's in there. So in answer to your question, do people really understand their supply chain and the, the resiliency risks that they have? I think no. Um, I think people do know that it's a problem. Uh, but have they got to the, the bitter end of it? No. Um, and, uh, you know, do a lot of people get shocked when, when they actually have a cybersecurity incident with the uh, lens that they have to go to to recover from it and try and remove whatever compromise they believe they have? I, I think it's quite a shocking experience for people, actually. 
Thanks, Paul. Okay, thanks, Jackie. And and Diane, it, 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 to follow on from that, I mean, um, I, I would imagine in New York and 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 the the client base is probably, dare I say, a little bit more litigious than than what we find in, um, for example, Dublin or, or or parts of Europe. Is is that a motivator for people to take cybersecurity seriously? Um, because what we're seeing here is uh, large scale breaches um, that are in the news for. Um, a day and then they're gone you know half a million records being breached they get notified law enforcement but nothing really happens there doesn't seem to be any civil action things take years to, to happen for there to be any um impact financially or from a quality perspective to that organization is it different in the united states um no i mean it, it's, it's the same it's the same thing i think you can't say this enough jeanette said it and jackie has echoed it you know coin the word people systems uh, it is all about the people in the, you know, they're the greatest threat to the data systems, I think. And, um, and I think Jackie is right. Not only do, you know, generally corporations not really think about continuity resilience, that they, they just really are not thinking about this in the way it needs to be thought about, which is why it keeps happening to a certain extent. Um, litigation. Um, I think that's a, you know, clearly you'd like to avoid that, but it, I think it's, it is more, um, it, it is more a fight with the insurance industry, which is increasingly being forced to make what is perceived as capital investments, forced capital investments into companies when this uh, type of activity occurs and the policies were not necessarily intended to cover that. And so there are a number of cases throughout the country now that we are watching and monitoring where the insurance companies are really pushing back on cyber coverage claims. Um, and so we'll see where that ends up. But so far, they've been pretty effective at not covering claims uh, unless specifically um, you had an assessment in place, you took reasonable precautions, you, you know, um, you acted reasonably and reasonably the bar is continuing to get higher. So again, to echo Jeanette's earlier comment, you have to assume that it's that it's there and that you are constantly looking for it inside, which is why the, the people and the training need to be a bigger, uh, more focal part of any kind of a, a management program. Fantastic advice that because I mean that obviously adds on to this huge challenge we have in the cybersecurity industry of of getting skilled people. There's over what four million open cybersecurity positions around the world. How, what what advice do, do you have? And I'll start with you, Rob, and, and maybe we all three could input on this. What advice do you have in relation to um, how to um, get those skilled people on your team, whether whether they're working operationally with you or working with clients um, to affect that culture and policy? Um, because when we think of it, we're allowing employees in to work on data, whether they're in a bank insurance company, and do do they really understand what they're dealing with? You, you know, um, and the value of the data they're working with. How, how do we how do we deal with that challenge of the cultural aspect, um, the, the the realization of the importance of the work they're doing and the impact it has on people's lives if they get it wrong? Um, can I start with you, Rob? Maybe as as a as a, a, a an SME um, and that challenge to try and recruit skilled people with the right moral and ethics to work in in this kind of environment. Well, the, the point you make about supply and demand is most definitely there. And, you know, because the demand is so high, um, the cost to, to try and recruit, um, you know, skilled security people is, is incredibly high. You know, for us, um, most of it is, is out of our reach. Uh, we, we, we can't, we can't afford to hire, um, you know, super duper, um, you know, best of the best, um, security people. So we rely on, organizations, as I said, who have the capability to do it. Now, we we look at um, cybersecurity internally at, almost as a state of mind. Um, we, we talk to all our staff regularly so that it is something that they think about and are tasked with being aware of all of the things that they do. Um, you know, the things that are within their control, you know, their, their own laptop, the, the things that they open and close, um, in terms of applications, attachments, 
uh, all of the things that potentially are going to cause us a problem. Um, equally, other things that are particularly sensitive for us, uh, anything that touches client data, um, any special categories of data, you know, things like biometric information um, that under GDPR, you know, is treated differently than, you know, just a regular name and, and phone number, for example. So all our staff are regularly um, reminded of what those things are. So it's front and center all the time. Um, and I think, you know, again, the theme of today, um, some of the earlier speakers um, has been about understanding where your risks are um, and sort of focusing your efforts on um, maintaining a posture that minimizes uh, damage that could be caused by an exposure to any one of those areas. Uh, and that's the way we take it. I mean, we know we're not perfect, um, but we also know that we can't afford to be perfect. Um, so we're, we're sort of balancing our risk um, all the time, readjusting as we need to. Um, and I think that's what most SMEs uh, have to do. Um, get it to be a state of mind, constantly thinking about it um, and adjust as necessary. Thanks, Rob. Th th great points. And and Jackie, if I can throw a little bit extra onto that question for yourself in relation to diversity and women in cybersecurity, how do we deal with this human challenge of education and getting the right kinds of people um, into the cybersecurity industry to help with this issue, or, which is a, a human issue? It has to come from leadership, obviously, the whole way down through the organization. It's not just about technology. If we're going to deal with it holistically, what key points or advice would you have uh, around that? I think, you know, you, you do really need to look at the qualities of the type of people that you you want to attract into cybersecurity. So, you know, the, the people who are attacking us are smart. There's no doubt about it. They have kind of, you know, nation state sponsorship behind a lot of them. Um, and then we also have people who are just playing with, with systems like, you know, script kiddies and things. So, if you, you know, who they've got all day and all night to, to, to try and get into your systems and use what's at their disposal to do it. And it's easy to get tools to, to go hacking. And so, we have to resume that the people who are trying to attack us are smart. So therefore, we want smart, kind of inquisitive um, people who enjoy working with puzzles. Like, you know, you, you want a certain type of person who's working in the technology side of cybersecurity. But you also need to balance that with the risk aspect. And, you know, you want people who are interested in risk, who understand it, who can understand the business risk as opposed to just the technological risk uh, that you're dealing with and blend all that in together. And it's definitely not um, a nine to five job working in cybersecurity. Um, if you want to get into the heart of it, uh, typically you will find that, um, you know, you, you may have to be available in the evenings and, and work through a breach with an organization or within your own organization. So you need to be quite interested and quite dedicated uh, to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there's there's kind of a, a you know, that civil service, you know, as in that I want to serve society um, aspect of a lot of people who work in cybersecurity. And I suppose in relation to the kind of gender piece in cybersecurity, for me, it, it doesn't matter whether you're man, woman or child, like, you know, if you want to work in cybersecurity and you've got the skills, that's great. Um, I think we have a shortage of women in cybersecurity. So we're leaving a lot of untapped talent that we probably need to uh, protect our countries, our organizations, um, et cetera, um, you know, not in the industry. So we need to work harder at making sure that we have the best talent, be they male or female, in cybersecurity. And it's great to see so many of the speakers today actually are women. The, uh, um, I, I think it's, it is something that is beginning to change and that's great to see. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Jackie. And then um, maybe if we, and I think this may be our, our last question, I think they want to go to a Q&A after this. But uh, Diane, on that question, um, and, uh, you know, Jackie's talk there about having people that that you know are interested in puzzles and may have that kind of propensity and and maybe even be uh, motivated by almost patriotism uh, in and how they want to work and protect their country uh, and uh, the businesses they work for and that's obviously where a lot of the cyber talent comes from the United States but I'm very intrigued by your own background where you, you you've you're a lawyer but yet you've gone off and got these cyber security qualifications don't we need lots more cyber lawyers uh, don't we need lots of cyber marketing people don't we need lots of other cyber uh, um, uh, type roles within organizations that that are complementary to their core activity but have a cyber element to them oh yes I definitely I definitely think so and I, I think you know, we're, we're moving in that direction. Uh, I mean, you know, the economy, life, um, 
social mores. I mean, everything is um, going more digital. And I think that it will just be, I mean, you know, you sort of move out of the industrial um, era into more of a digital era. And I think we're in the growing pains now of that transition, both, you know, socially, politically, economically. So, yeah, I think it'll only continue to grow. A lot of the jobs that dis- get displaced now will be replaced uh, on the digital side. Absolutely. And would you think we are talking Diane, baseline of expectations required from insurance companies, do you think things like uh, board members being qualified on cybersecurity, business leaders um, from the very top being qualified around cybersecurity in the absence of a CISO, for example, do you think that's the kind of thing that insurance companies are looking for as a baseline requirement? Not yet, um, but we are advocating that they get there. The SEC is there. The Chamber of Commerce is there. You know, board members in in general, uh, you know, grew up in in an industrial age because they're they're older. And you really need someone on the board or at least a couple of people on the board who really understand how businesses function today, because it it really is about the technology. Um, Most companies are data companies now. And um, so, yeah, having people on the board as opposed to just someone to come in to give a 10 minute presentation and they leave and they only come in a couple times during the year to update at a very high level is just not sufficient. And that's why we continue to see the problems that we see. Fantastic. Well, look, it's just nice to say thank you so much to Diane, Jackie and Rob for, for, for your time today. It's been a very interesting uh, session. And I think uh, I'll hand over now to Connor, who has a, a Q&A. So thank you, guys. Uh, thank you very much. Um, there's just a couple of questions that come in from the audience. Jackie, if I could pick up a point with you first, and you were talking about um, how to identify for the business the cost of investment into cybersecurity. And, you know, it was seen as an overhead, but it's actually not an overhead. It's, it's a requirement. It's almost, as you said, in the business transformation line, it belongs. Um, if I asked you in terms of, in, of cybersecurity investment from businesses into their businesses, where is it at right now versus where it should be, uh, do you think? Um, that's a really interesting question. And we, we often, um, when we're working with organizations to see what level of maturity they're at, one of the questions that we would ask them is what percentage of their technology spend, because that's typically budget under the CTO, um, would they spend on cybersecurity? And, um, you know, anything under 10% and you've probably got some challenges. The, uh, um, but we, we normally do a survey every year and it's interesting um, we we speak to like kind of I think it's like four thousand different organisations kind of globally, and somebody just pinged me yesterday to say it's looking as if people have actually really upped their spend on cybersecurity uh, comparatively this year, um, and whether that's an impact of of uh, what's happened with COVID or or why I, I don't know yet. So we'd have to do some further analysis into that as we go through that data. Um, but to me, I think that there's a balance. You know, when you look at something you know, you have a cost of doing business, you have, you know, a a value of your assets and you need to protect all that proportionately. Um, And if you look at something financially, the kind of controls that you can put in place for it, you need to say, well, is it worth it? Like, what's the alternative if I got breached and I got a regulatory fine or what's my reputation worth? So you need to look at the, the value of the assets and how much you're prepared to spend in order to protect those. And it's very interesting when you spill that into things like ransomware like we're seeing with ransomware today that that the attackers are actually um doing a lot of research on an organization beforehand and often breaking in and looking to see whether they've got cyber insurance what's the policy worth um like how much is this organization going to be prepared to pay and they'll hit you with exactly that amount you know whether it's 1 million or 10 million so they're very good at, at making an evaluation of how much you value your cybersecurity and how much they think you'll pay. So we should equally be able to work out how much we should spend and then work out how we're going to spend it. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Uh, the second question, Rob, if I may address it to you, uh, talks, and you mentioned uh, internal and external actors, and we heard in the first segment, you know, the notion of bad actors, and you talked about identifying them. Maybe from an SME perspective, How do I go about or how does one go about identifying those bad internal external actors? And then the second part is how does one go about preparing to protect against that? Well, the first thing is knowing who everybody is in within 
within your system, um, I, I need to know who you are um, reliably, um, whether that is, you know, an employee um, or, or an external contractor. Uh, I need to know who you are. Making sure, for example, that um, credentials aren't reused, um, that everybody has their own ID um, is, is a, a really big thing. You know, where, where, you know, I issue a credential to somebody um, just for argument's sake in a hospital and they leave it on the desk. Uh, somebody comes along and picks it up and logs in as that person. Well, the system will think that it is the, the first person, not the, the second person. So making sure that you've got controls around how um, identity and credentials are used both internally and externally is extremely important. Um, your um, revocation policy, um, when somebody leaves the organization, make sure that you remove them from your system. Uh, onboarding, uh, everybody pays a lot of attention to, but they don't pay much attention to offboarding or enough attention to offboarding. Make sure that you don't have old, stale information lying around. Get rid of it as quickly as you can or archive it. Um, and and keeping, uh, keeping credentials fresh, um, you know, forcing refreshes. Um, you know, everybody has seen over the last while um, you know, strong customer authentication starting to appear for transactions over 30 euros, 50 euros as you buy things. Well, the same should exist um, when it uh, comes to accessing, you know, data assets, computer assets of, of different kinds. Force that diligence uh, to make sure that you know who is touching what when. Um, and if you do that, you know, reasonably well, um, you will be able to protect most things pretty well. Um, that, that would be where I'd, I'd sort of place the most general uh, emphasis. I mean, obviously there are sort of end of the spectrum things that you could you could do where you've got ultra um, sensitive or, or security um, related things that, that you need to give special attention to. But for the vast majority of SMEs out there, um, you know, do the basic things really well um, and you will protect really well. I would Fantastic. Um Thank you so much, Rob. Uh, can I just say thank you to our panel, to Paul uh, for moderating superbly. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate your time. And to Diane, Rob and Jackie for your insights. Uh, very much appreciated. And thank you for coming in to talk to us uh, this afternoon. Um, and finally, uh, moving to the human aspect of, of cybersecurity, um, I'm delighted to be joined by our panel to discuss Towards a Safer Cyberspace. We have Jeremy Epstein, who is the lead program director um, uh, uh, of Secure and Trustworthy Cyberspace at the US National Science Foundation. We've Dr. Mary Aiken, PhD. She's a professor of uh, forensic cyber psychology uh, at University of East London, and it's moderated by our, our colleague, uh, Robert Morrow, Bob, uh, from the Boston College. So I'll hand over to that panel. Uh, just to say to the audience, we're probably running about 10 minutes behind, so please do bear with us. We'll try to make up some of the time, but please stay on. This is a fascinating discussion that you'll he hear and see, uh, and we will take time for just one question at the end of it. So hand over to you, Bob, in conversation. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, for the next panel, Beyond Cybersecurity, Towards a Safer Cyberspace. We're joined by Dr. Mary Aiken and Jeremy Epstein. Uh, Dr. Aiken is a professor of forensic cyber psychology at the University of East London. She's an adjunct professor at the University of College Dublin, Dublin, an academic advisor at Europol's European Cybersecurity Center, a member of Interpol's Global Cyber C Crime Expert Group, and author uh, of the acclaimed book, The Cyber Effect. Uh, Jeremy Epstein is lead program director for secure and trustworthy cyberspace at the U.S. National Science Foundation. Uh, this is the flagship NSF multidisciplinary cybersecurity and privacy program. Uh, prior to joining NSF, uh, Jeremy was at DARPA, um, where he headed a project on secure and trustworthy cyberspace. He's also vice chair of the Association for Computing Machinery um, and U.S. Technology Policy Committee, uh, where he founded a scholarship for women in information security. And Jeremy has a passion uh, for election and voting security, both issues um, we will get turned to um, in just a moment. Uh, I think we'll start first with Dr. Aiken. Um, Mary, can you talk to us a little bit about what cyber psychology is and how it relates to cybersecurity? So cyber psychology is the study of the impact of technology on human behavior. My specialist area is forensic cyber psychology, 
which is the study of criminal, deviant and abnormal behavior online. And unfortunately, in this day and age, I'm kept pretty busy. The, um, it, it's uh, an advanced discipline within applied psychology, about 20 years um, in existence now. And it really big, brings together uh, technology and psychology in terms of explanatory value. Um, uh, so yeah, that's cyber psychology. And um, what does what do you do as a cyber psychologist when it comes to cybersecurity? We've been talking, obviously, in the run up to this about something called safety tech um, is, is, is sort of where this space meets. And so maybe you could talk to us a little bit about what safety tech is and what impact it has for the cybersecurity field. Yeah, so the first thing in terms of cyber psychology, um, we argue that human behavior changes or mutates in cyber context. There's an amplification and escalation often. And we also hypothesize uh, cyberspace as being a powerful psychological environment. So in 2016, NATO ratified cyberspace as a domain acknowledging that the battles of the future will take place on land, sea and air and on computer networks. So we now have to start thinking about cyberspace as an environment. And what we can do is we can go back to the work of Prochansky, uh, a great environmental psychologist, and consider the impact of environment on human behavior. So people are growing up in cyberspace. The behavior is changing. It changes for criminal population, it changes for sophisticated threat actors, it changes for activists and hacktivists, but it also changes for general population. To date, we've had huge investment in cybersecurity, but cybersecurity focuses on protecting data, information, networks, and systems. It does not focus on protecting what it is to be human online. And we've seen this new evolution, and I work closely with the UK government in this area, where we have this emerging, very exciting sector uh, described as the online safety technology sector or safety tech. And what's the difference between safety tech and cybersecurity? It's that difference of focusing on humans online. And we want our networks and systems to be robust, resilient, and secure. But we also want the people who use and operate those systems to be psychologically robust, resilient, and secure. We're conducting research at the moment into the US safety tech sector. And the good news is we're seeing evidence of an emerging and thriving sector. So safety tech will offer technology solutions to technology facilitated problem behaviors, ranging from uh, cyberbullying through to online harassment, through to mis and disinformation online. And I'll just wrap up by saying that it's very hard often to explain these abstract constructs of, well, what does mis and disinformation online mean? Or what are the consequences of mis and disinformation? Does it matter? Well, it matters because there's a symbiotic relationship between the real world and cyberspace. And the recent events of Capitol Hill are an absolute example of what happens when online harm, mis and disinformation, um, builds online and then spills over into the real world with tragic consequences. Uh, thanks, Mary. We'll come back to uh, some of that. I think people will be really interested to hear about the relationship between the online and the digital and, and the analog world. Uh, but Jeremy, uh, Mary highlighted during um, her remarks there that there's a evidence that there's a growing safety tech industry in the U.S. Um, you know, what role does NSF have to play in in this emerging field, um, or you know, or or does it have a have a role to play? Thank you for the opportunity to join you, and I need to start out by saying my opinions are my opinions and don't necessarily reflect those of the U.S. government, the usual disclaimer. Uh, NSF's role and, and the Secure and Trustworthy Cyberspace Program that I lead, or SATSE as we call it, um, is, is a very broad program, and, and I view it actually somewhat differently, slightly differently than Mary, that we view cybersecurity as including all the things she talked about. Um, we don't 
view those as separate. We call our program cyber technical um, uh, as, as the space. And so we view that all of these uh, topic areas are, in fact, legitimate areas for cybersecurity research. Our funding comes from both our computer science area uh, and also our social sciences area. We have, um, we, we fund hundreds of projects that are uh, socio-technical uh, in nature, including many of the topics uh, that Mary suggested. I think that's one difference, perhaps, between um, our program in the U.S. and programs in some other countries. On the positive uh, side, though, we're seeing a lot more international interest in it. We have a joint program in cybersecurity research between uh, uh, the National Science Foundation, uh, Science Foundation Ireland, SFI, and the uh, Department for the Economy, DFE, in Northern Ireland, where we're encouraging uh, researchers to come together from all three jurisdictions to submit joint proposals to the three agencies, which then, then fund them jointly. Uh, so I, I agree very much with Mary. These are crucial uh, areas that we can't look at cybersecurity as just a technical area the way we did maybe 10 or 20 years ago, that it is, it encompasses all these areas, cyberbullying, disinformation, et cetera. Some of the uh, other issues I'm less familiar with, uh, but, but we view that any solution needs to address all of these different, the human aspects as well as the technical aspects. What kind of, um, I mean, you, you just talked about bringing uh, researchers to get together and across a multidisciplinary um, space, but what kinds of things can NSF do to encourage, um, you know, psychologists, social scientists of different kinds, political scientists, sociologists to work with uh, those in the tech um, feels like, like computer science. So I started a program within NSF, within the SASC program about seven or eight years ago, where we uh, encouraged uh, social scientists and computer scientists who had not previously worked together to uh, submit joint research proposals uh, on new topic areas. And we ended up uh, through that, I think, somewhere around 100 research projects we started up with, with seed funding, uh, with uh, psychologists, sociologists, criminologists, gerontologists, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, every kind of ologist you can, you can think about uh, from the social sciences. And they, they cover a wide gamut of topics like how do people react to hook, hooking up to an open Wi-Fi hotspot in a bad neighborhood as opposed to a good neighborhood. That might seem pretty trivial, but, but it, it affects how uh, people view security. Um, uh, what sort of nudges can we give people to recognize the, the risk of putting things in their phone and how do they react uh, if they're in a, an area where they feel safe or unsafe? So we, we definitely encourage these sorts of joint research programs. And we've held a number of workshops to uh, bring together people from these different disciplines. Oh, that's, that's, uh, that's really fascinating. Now, Mary, um, you know, in, as a researcher, um, and you just released a, a report um, where you co-authored a report on the UK safety tech industry. I mean, what are some of the successful policy um, you know, initiatives that governments have brought in to help bring uh, communities together, to, your communities of researchers together to address these topics. Jeremy has been talking about what NSF is doing. I mean, where do you see the direction in the UK and Europe on, on, on in, in these similar areas? I think that the most important piece of legislation that is um, going through the system at the moment in the UK is the the online harms bill because in terms of defining the problem space for the first time it looks at creating this uh, you know spectrum of online harm in terms of the connectivity between these various problem behaviors and the at an eu level we're also seeing legislation in and around the audiovisual media uh, services directive, which is really about protecting uh, minors online in terms of the sort of online content that they're um, engaging with, 
Um, and that has to do with age verification and the concept of online harms. Uh, we have a report coming out in two weeks time uh, for Ofcom, who will be the regulator of the online of, of um, video services online. So Instagram, TikTok, you know, et cetera. And the, the regulation will attempt to, to protect uh, young people from online harms, uh, specifically in terms of video uh, sharing platforms. But to protect people from harm, you have to define, well, what is the harm? And that's where it gets a little more complicated. So in our research, we did a, a large um, literature review and rather than creating a taxonomy of harm, we created a taxonomy of risk of harm. You know, what are the sort of risks that are prevalent? And then we also introduced the safety tech taxonomy to create a sort of framework of benefits, risk of harm, uh, social solutions, which is education awareness, raising, etc. more of the same of what we've all been doing for 20 years. And then factoring in uh, safety tech solutions that deploy at a platform level, at a system level, at an endpoint level, and in the information environment. So it's really connecting uh, technology solutions with, with, which, with legislative um, efforts. We'll be looking at the same thing uh, in the US. And I agree with Jeremy in terms of, yeah, we've had HCI. Um, for years in the space in terms of trying to factor in humans in a cyber context. But this is not about the speed of how fast your screen scrolls or how big your thumbs are in terms of human computer interaction. This is ab about the profound and pervasive impact of of technology on humans uh, at a psychological level in terms of the individual and a sociological level in terms of the group. And this new focus on safety tech is evidenced by the number of bills and hearings going through the US, um, uh, be, being proposed in the US at the moment. I'll just list some of them. Uh, you've got the PACT Act and Section 230, which is actually looking at um, specifically at um, disseminating speech online and, and implications in and around uh, 230. You have emerging trends in online foreign influence uh, operations, social media, COVID-19 and election security. Um, another act you have a country in crisis, how disinformation online is dividing the nation. So these are a series of hearings and bills that are being proposed. You have the Countering Online Harms Act, May 19, 2020, which will require the Federal Trade Commission to study and report how AI may be used to identify, remove, take action to address online harms, content furthering other illegal activities such as the sale of opioids, opioids, uh, child sexual exploitation, terrorism, and the sale of counterfeit products. You also have the Earn It Act, holding the tech industry accountable for the fight against online child sexual exploitation, March 2020. You have the Americans at Risk, Manipulation and Deception in the Digital Age Act, uh, January 2020. And very recently, Senator Mark Warner et al. announced the Safeguarding Against Fraud, Exploitation, Threats, Extremism and Consumer Harms, the Safe Tech Act, which will aim to reform Section 230 and allow social media companies to be held accountable for enabling cyber stalking, target harassment and discrimination on their platforms. So I would argue that there is certainly a major wave at the moment in the US in terms of focusing on online safety, focusing on online harms, that is something very distinct from the cybersecurity practices to date. Um, and, and Mary, you um, you already raised this issue um, in, in, your, in, in your previous comments, but you, you, we talked a little bit about that relationship between what is happening online and what happens to individuals and groups of individuals. We, and, and you raised the uh, you know the January sixth insurrection um, at, at Congress. I mean, like, could you tell us what is at stake here ultimately? I mean, we we democracy. We really talk <laughs> democracy. <laughs> Um, you know, we are sleepwalking our way into an, into this age of technology. We adopt each emerging technology with the collective 
wisdom of lemmings leaping off a cliff. Just because it's new doesn't mean it's good. Technology will only mean progress when we can mitigate harmful effects. And to mitigate those effects, we have to understand them. We have to understand this complex architecture. We have to understand why human behavior changes. We have to understand what happens when populations syndicate online. So let me give you an example. And I write about this in my book, The Cyber Effect, a theoretical construct that I describe as, the, uh, as online syndication. So it's really the mathematics of criminal deviant and abnormal behavior. So in a real world context, the incidence of these behaviors was bound or capped by the laws of proximity and domain. What does that mean? You're a sex offender in the north of the country. I'm a sex offender in the south of the country. What was the chances of us coming together to normalize and socialize our deviant interests? It was capped. And also, we it would present great risk to ourselves to, to state that preference. But now, under the cover of anonymity and fueled by online disinhibition, these populations can come together to normalize and socialize their belief systems. So whether you're a 13 year old girl with an eating disorder who finds a pro Anna website, or whether you're somebody who believes the election was stolen and now you surround yourself with a whole cohort that reinforce that belief system, the same thing is happening. And what we have to factor in is, well, what is the impact on society. Uh, Professor Tim Wu writes about the attention economy, about monetizing our attention, and the algorithms that underlie that monetization effect pull towards the extreme. And that's how you keep somebody's attention. So if you start watching, uh, you know, cop you know, uh, cop car chases on YouTube, eventually you get hauled towards something very extreme. These weapons of mass distraction are designed to hold our attention and pull us to the extreme. And we all talk about filter bubbles and getting caught up. If you get caught up in a filter bubble because you like to work out, you end up getting Nike trainers or protein powders or gym memberships, you know, hurled at you. The worst thing that is going to happen is that you're going to become more fit. But what happens when you get caught in a distorted filter bubble and those belief systems are normalized and socialized and then that explodes back into the real world. So this is what I'm interested in focusing on is explaining these behaviors, understanding these behaviors, understanding the impact and understanding the impact for society. And when we talk about anonymity online and Jeremy, I know that um, you know when we chatted before. You know this, this, you know this, the the importance of privacy and the importance of 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 how we sort of legislate in this space and how you know the integrity of our data and our online um, our our online identities. But when you argue about anonymity, you know people argue that it's a basic human right. It is not a basic human right. It is an invention of the internet. And we have to have that conversation as to about the greater good. You, you know, yes, we want anonymity in some context and some, you know, uh, oppressed regime where somebody wants to tweet or vlog or blog, but at what cost? And if the cost is child sexual abuse and exploitation, if the cost is rampant cyber criminality, if the cost is, is you know, cyber attacks or threats or, you know, then, then we need as a society to have that conversation. And when you talk about uh, privacy and collective security and the vitality of the tech uh, industry, none of those aims should have primacy over the other. And personally, I make no apology for being pro, uh, pro social order in the real world and in cyberspace. But I really worry about how we can deliver on collective security when increasingly you see uh, encrypted domains that are effectively beyond the rule of law. Um. 
Thanks, Mary. Uh, Jeremy, um, Mary's been talking about filter bubbles um, and the, the importance of, of the existential threat they present to both our society and, and to individuals. And she then raised this prospect about the trade-offs between privacy, anonymity, and, and a public good. In, in your role at NSF, when you are thinking about these issues, how do you how do you make decisions, or is it up to you to make decisions, you know, about this in the way you you know you encourage research calls and encourage uh, collaborate you know academics to work together? Well, certainly we have the ability to influence the direction things go because. Uh, like it or not, it's our responsibility to uh, allocate uh, public taxpayer money into research, and there isn't enough money to cover everything. So our decisions do de facto uh, influence those things. Uh, we try, of course, to um, the NSF model, as is the case in many funding agencies is to use the uh, peer review panels to ensure we're getting lots of good opinions. Uh, but we bring our own uh, opinions as well. Uh, we, the people who work as program officers are experts uh, in, in the field. And we try to uh, have many people look at everything to uh, uh, get lots of, of opinions. One of the things that, that I want to focus on in uh, a little bit is the interaction between privacy and some of the, the, the topics that Mary mentioned, as, as she said, one of my concerns with uh, automating um, many of the um, uh, technologies, the techniques that we need to do to address these problems at scale uh, uh, can themselves introduce privacy issues, introduce bias issues. Um, it's always been the case that, for example, uh, uh, there's been bias in hiring, um, that, that it's been harder for, for women and people of color to uh, get jobs. Um, but now we have these uh, AI systems, as was famously um, revealed a few years ago by Amazon, where something that was supposedly uh, impartial, in fact, made things worse, much worse, because it said, these are the sorts of people we've hired in the past, and let's find more people who look like them. Uh, and it turns out, not just look like them intellectually, but look like them physically. And so it provided, um, uh, because, because as an example, uh, the typical uh, um, Amazon uh, technology worker had not come from a historically black college or university was not a female, was not a Hispanic, et cetera. It picked more people like them that <laughs> didn't have those characteristics that we in fact want to increase um, uh, diversity. And, and my concern is as if we try to automate some of these other technologies to, for example, stop cyberbullying by mapping out using artificial intelligence, this is what cyberbullying looks like. Do we have confidence that? it will in fact stop cyberbullying and it won't accidentally uh, stop other desirable things or discriminate uh, by identifying uh, language used uh, in some communities that might uh, be uh, different from the language used in the dominant culture uh, and, and result in falsely identifying some discussions as cyberbullying when they're not. It's just a difference in, in cultural use of language. So these are the sorts of things that we have to balance is not just what is cyberbullying, but what are the social impacts uh, and how does AI make things worse or better or both? Um, it's not always gonna be obvious what the answer is. The people who write these AI systems with in, in vast majorities, they are not trying to discriminate. But when you train these systems using real data that is in fact biased, you get biased results. It's sort of a garbage in, garbage out scenario, except nobody knows whether the input is in fact garbage. Uh, so the, these are some of the challenges we have to do. And these are things we'll be funding at NSF is, is looking at some of these challenges to make sure we're getting uh, different angles on the problem. Um, that, that, that's really interesting. I, on, on some of these kind of innovative challenges, the challenges around the data, um, and, and you, you're contemplating, I meant, at NSF, in, in your relationship with 
um, industry and 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 those people who are behind you know funding industry, the investors and the the, the venture capital community. I mean, are they alive? to these challenges or is it up to you to sort of convey that that message um, as the the safety tech industry grows in the US so um, we, we have worked at NSF with people from industry we did a joint program with Amazon a few years ago um, uh, to fund research uh, in um, artificial intelligence and ethics uh, and there was a lot of controversy about that because people thought that Amazon was going to be uh, passing judgment on what ethics research got funded. Uh, and in fact, they weren't, but th there was a lot of press about that that was inaccurate. Um, uh, so we, we definitely work with industry. We're, we're starting a brand new program. We just announced it about a month ago called uh, Designing Accountable Software Systems. Um, where we're encouraging people to look at uh, how do we build software systems that we uh, ensure are doing what we want them to do and that are compliant with legislation and regulation. Uh, people may not realize that even when there's laws, a lot of times the computer systems we have don't enforce them. There was a case, uh, since my interest is in voting and security, there was a case a number of years ago, I think about 10 years ago, where it turned out that uh, in New York State, there was a law that said you could have what's called rank choice voting, where you could pick the preference order, not just one candidate, but you could say, this is my preference order. And then this got implemented in software to choose uh, who won the race. It turned out the software didn't implement the same algorithm as described in the law. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and it shouldn't happen, but <laughs> software is one kind of artifact and law is a different kind of artifact. And the people who build these are not the same. The lawyers may not understand what's possible in software and the software developers may not understand the, the subtleties of the law. And yet somehow we have to build systems that bring these things together. And that's going to be a lot more complex. And many of the issues that, that Mary raises if, if we have laws and regulations that it require that we act in certain ways, we still have to figure out how to tell the programmers how to actually implement these in ways that are consistent with what the law intends uh, so that we get the results we think we're going to get instead of something that's close but not quite the same as what was intended. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Bob, just a, a fascinating sure. point uh, that Jeremy has uh, flagged up there, because I think it shows the need for a transdisciplinary approach. So we have computer scientists, we have cyber psychologists, but we need criminologists as well working together. And I think the point about online harms and these criminal deviant or abnormal behaviors online is they increasingly have the characteristics of big data in terms of volume and velocity and variety. And therefore we're going to need AI and ML solutions to actually tackle them, but also to prosecute, mm -hmm. you know, to gather the evidence. And I think the real breakthroughs will come when we can write an algorithm that actually defines cyberbullying, you know, as a mathematical equation, content by direction, by interval, by frequency equals, you know, our harassment and, mm -hmm. and then deploy that. But then you get into surveillance issues, you know, that, that, you, that you know, an infringement of privacy, but, you know, so it's this, this constant sort of, um, very interesting discussion that we need to have because the law enforcement are swamped. They're absolutely swamped. There's, I'm writing a paper for Europol at the moment and it's titled the cyber blue line. And it's based on the thin red line, you know, a, a stretched resource meeting irresistible force. That's what's happening in cyberspace. Um, and, and we need to have these conversations to work towards uh, constructing solutions. Uh, that's really fascinating. Uh, we have about a minute left, and I just want to close uh, on one final question. Um, I, you know, we've been talking a, a lot about you know how to bring academia, industry, the funding agencies together, and it sounds like there is agreement right now, or there is some agreement at least on what some of the challenges are and where some of the pinch points are. I mean, how do we ensure that that conversation about the emerging threats and challenges uh, continues? 
in a way that keeps pace with those emerging uh, threats. I'm not, not sure uh, you guys have given too much thought to this. And we only have about a minute left, uh, so there's not much time to cover it. But Mary, maybe you could start. I think that we need accessible funding and we need rapid research. You know, the traditional scientific process in terms of applying for grants, being awarded the grant, collecting the data, uh, you know, peer review, publishing, there is a possibility, if not a probability, that the phenomenon under study is already passed by the time we have research to inform the process. So for me, the solution lies in rapid research and, and accessible funding to actually provide evidence-based solutions to some of these challenges. And Jeremy, how do you ensure that NSF is keeping a pace? I, I love uh, what Mary said because we have a program we call RAPID at NSF, <laughs> which is designed for exactly this purpose. Uh, we, we, we fund projects um, when, when the COVID uh, pandemic began within uh, Two weeks, we had a, a call out on the street saying, give us your best research in any topic uh, within science, uh, including cybersecurity and privacy and interdisciplinary, areas, but, but certainly not limited to those. And we funded within computer science alone, I think we funded 60 or 80 research projects relating to COVID. We got those started within six weeks of the, of the beginning of the pandemic. We're seeing results. Some of the early stuff was... Uh, um, some of the uh, tracking, uh, privacy protecting tracking technologies. We continue uh, to do that. Um, and we're always open to ideas uh, in those areas. It, it doesn't have to be specifically when we have a call out, but we're always open to them. I'm about to fund one right now uh, on looking at how people share uh, pictures of people of other uh, uh, racial and ethnic groups and what uh, as memes and what those mean in terms of discrimination and in terms of bias. So we're, we're open to all, all sorts of uh, new ideas uh, like that. And I think that's really crucial. And it's also crucial that it, a lot of it be international. And so I'm very excited about our new uh, program uh, in cybersecurity writ large with the Republic of Ireland and with Northern Ireland. Right. Well, thank you very much. Um, Jeremy Epstein, Lead Program Director for Secure and Trustworthy Cyberspace at the U.S. National Science Foundation, and obviously very integrated into uh, the ecosystem in Ireland and Northern Ireland. And of course, uh, Dr. Mary Aiken, Professor of Forensic Cyber Psychology at the University of East London and an adjunct professor at UCD, also equally plugged into what is happening in, in Ireland and Europe. Thank you for your insights today and thank you for your time. I very much appreciate it. Uh, Jeremy, Bob and Mary, thank you for a, a fascinating discussion um, and uh, Mary has had to leave us but I do have Jeremy and Bob still with us so thanks for that. Uh, I love the weapons of mass distraction, it's a, it's a fantastic uh, comment. Bob, we're really tight for time, so uh, I'm going to say thank you uh, to Boston College. I'm going to say a big thank you uh, to the U.S. Embassy uh, and to my own team here in Dublin BIC um, uh, for pulling this event together. Um, Fantastic event, some really great insights. Jeremy, I'm going to leave the last word to you and, and, and let me just frame it, if I may, for you. So we spent a lot of time thinking cybersecurity, it's a very significant issue. It touches you know, all dimensions of our society. And we're seeing that there's an, a, you know, an astounding amount of analysis, understanding, investment, innovation are taking place um, to kind of build up a resilience and to kind of help us to prepare for it. My question to you to wrap us up uh, for the event today, in terms of what you're seeing, in terms of the research that you're seeing, in terms of, and a lot of it is at an early stage, if we invited you to come back here in three or four years time, what's the one big shift, if there is one, or there's a few, but what's the big shift that we'll see in a couple of years time from your perspective, would you think? Well, that's a small question to start <laughs> or to finish up with. Um, I think uh, what we're seeing, what we've seen over the past decade is that uh, socio-technical aspects of computing and cybersecurity are increasingly recognized. You've got a computer in anything you have. I tried to write down, actually I gave a talk recently to a group of federal judges and I came up with a list of seven items and I asked them, uh, which of these things does not uh, have a security risk, uh, or excuse me, which of these things does not actually exist commercially 
and therefore doesn't have a security risk. And the only thing I could come up with that uh, didn't actually exist commercially um, that had a, with a cybersecurity risk was a s'mores maker. If you're not familiar, this is an American uh, dessert food that's eaten when camping. That was the only thing I could come up with that didn't have a computer in it. Um, so we're going to see the ubiquity of computing, the ubiquity of cybersecurity risks, the socio-technical aspects. Uh, it's going to be a bigger problem. When I got into cybersecurity 30 years ago, my mother asked me, is there a future in that field? Um, 30 years ago, uh, it wasn't quite so clear. Now, I think it's very clear and uh, we all need to be uh, focusing on security and privacy going forward. Fantastic. Jeremy, thanks so much. Um, I really appreciate the insights. And yeah, a big question to, to finish us off in a short time. Uh, again, so thank you for joining us and thank you for your insights in the panel. Bob, um, thank you to the team at Boston College. We really appreciate working with you on this and we look forward to doing more of these into the future. We hope that you and the alumni and the team have got some value out of today's event. So from all of us at Dublin BIC, thank you and good afternoon.